Welcome everybody to another episode of Alta's Head to Head. Today we have a very special guest with us, Andrea Vaknas. Uh, she loves to be called Andy, so I'm gonna call her Andy. <laughs> and I'm so happy to be hosting her today for another episode of our Alta's Head to Head. I hope you guys like it. Me. Sure, Andy. Thanks for being here and thanks for having the time, Ashley, to interview us. So, Andy, um, this interview is going to be very cordial and friendly and, you know, I want to know who is Andy. So, please go ahead and maybe tell me something about yourself, tell me something about your background and then so the audience know you a little bit. Okay. Well, I was born a long, long time ago. I'm not going to tell you when. <laughs> and I am actually from the Rhineland originally. I was born in Koblenz, um, grew up there for nine years. Then we moved to Darmstadt because of my father's professional shift. Um, and Darmstadt's near Frankfurt. And um, I lived, stayed, lived there for another nine years. And then I moved on to Freiburg, so where I started my studies and professional not professional career, that was only a little later. And I lived there for another nine years, so you can actually take your pick. Um, in the meantime, um, when I lived in Freiburg, I actually split up the time there. So I also spent some time in England, which is where my heart is to this day. And um, I also lived in the Netherlands for um, some time. So um, all to do with my studies. So what brought you, what brought you to all these places? Um, this was actually connected to my subjects I studied at university, which was German and English, Germanistic and Anglistic. And um, actually my English wasn't that good and I failed my intermediate exam. Oh my God, so I'm telling true? some secrets here okay. <laughs> because of prepositions, which is something I love to teach these days. Okay. And um, I had to do this year abroad. I lived as an assistant, uh, worked as an assistant teacher. And um, yeah, I always tell my students this as well. Um, I lived in England, I studied in England, I taught in England, and I came back and I retook my exam with zero mistakes. So the English pubs helped me a lot to... Um, was that the push? Was that the push to go and improve your English? Because you said, listen, that's my weakness, I gotta improve on it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we had to. We had to go abroad as part of the studies. And I also wanted to. I mean, I have family in England. Uh, my grandparents lived in London and I have family in Sheffield to this day and in the south of England still. Um, but I actually wanted to make it on my own. So I stayed um, in the place in a small town called Wigan, which is between Manchester and Liverpool. And I chose that because at that time I was still um, a Beatles fan. Oh, wow. I Who is moved it? moved on from there. Who is it? Who is it? <laughs> and, yeah, and I found my best friends there. And we are friends to this day. And this is more than 30 years ago now. So, wow. Yeah. It's an amazing time over there. I bet, I bet the culture had a big influence on you, correct? It certainly did. Um, okay. It was, the culture was, and also the language training, because I remember um, moving to Wigan, and I thought my English was quite good, also because of the family background, because my grandparents only ever spoke, spoke to me in English. Um, but I remember arriving in Lancashire um, and asking somebody for the way, and I thought, <laughs> I can't do this because I, I didn't understand the person. And then there's my favorite story of asking my friend um, when I went into town and wanted to bring something back, um, whether he needed anything. And he went, oh, I bring us some bog rolls then. And I thought, yeah, OK. I didn't understand. So I had, I had some training, I had very good training. And I think this helped me with also tolerating so many different accents because I had to learn so hard to understand the people in Lancashire Correct. and it opened me up in a way to understand people from from other areas as well and I always try to really listen and focus which also 
helped me a lot with my teaching, and I think that had a great effect on that as well. So. That is a great point. You see, this is, I just want to do a quick crossover. Um, one of the most important things that we actually have to uh, handle in English in language teaching is cultures, different yeah. cultures. So, so what do you think? You are you you are a German person who went to the United Kingdom. Yeah. So, how do you, how do you see that that cultural um, impact on you? Hmm, that's a good question. It had a big impact. Um, I think because of the German history in general, I always wanted to sort of step back a little bit from being German. Um, my big aim when I went to England was not to be recognized as a German speaker. I always aimed to reach this native accent, um, which works when I go to the States. People okay. think I'm, I'm English, I'm British, which goes down like That's that. what I thought when I first met you, to be honest. Okay. Because so you have when... a sweet British accent. Okay, thank you. <laughs> However, when I came back from, from Wigan and went back to university, I was told off by my New Zealand lecturer, who had a great impact on me with teaching, that I shouldn't speak this broad Lancashire accent because wow. that was not acceptable at okay. university. So okay. I, I, her words still ring in my ears. She said, we speak received pronunciation here. And I thought, mm. wow. so, and with that, I think that was the first time, even as a student, I actually realized that we have something like global English, which is what I'm trying to teach now. Um, I mean, there's this diver uh, the difference of American and British English, and we make fun of it a lot. And, you know, with sure. my American friends, we always have these sort of fights, fun yeah. fights right. about which is the better accent. But I think what is important is that you can be understood by people globally, and therefore your language should be clear, no matter what accent, no matter where you come from, but have it clear to be, yeah understood by everybody and Absolutely. be clear there, so. Absolutely. Now that you mention it, is there such a thing, because you know there's a lot of people, companies, students asking for, oh, you know what, this is American English, I want to learn British English, I want to learn American English. What do you think about, what's, what's your response to that? as a professional teacher? Is there such a thing as, as an American British? Uh, well, there is, definitely. I mean, I think people can, can tell from the difference in our accents, you, you definitely sound American, <laughs> whereas I hope to sound somewhat British or the, to the, towards the British, British side. Um, but I don't think it matters. I don't think... Um, I mean, of course, you have your identity, your American, British, Australian, South African, wherever identity, like you have in German and like you have with any other language. But I don't think this should be an issue. Um, Correct. I think people should understand each other and aim to understand each other. Um, that goes for the language more than anything. Yeah. Because, you know, speaking of culture, sometimes perhaps with, the, with that, that um, do you call it dialect, accent, whatever you call it, that, the derivative of, of English language called American or British, perhaps there's also a cultural weight that, that oh, is definitely. I mean, the culture, the culture shapes the language, I would say. And English, I'm afraid to say, and this is the English student of mm. former times coming out in me, English isn't a language. Mm. I am sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> English yeah. is a mixture of many languages. And this is what I try to tell students. I mean, there are so many things that, where there are similarities, mm -hmm. um, where language developed or derived from its first language, and that goes for every language, German is the same, I would say, but with English it's more obvious because it's on a, on a newer scale, newer level. Um, this the H and D business, for example, just, just to mention one thing, you have three in English and drei in German, so you can see where the English stole it from us, sure, if you sure. want to say so. <laughs> but these connections are there, and there's always an influence from other languages on the one language, and you uh, target language, if you want to say so. And this is what keeps a language alive. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think we can see a shift there um, nowadays with who has an influence on the English language. Um, if I refer to German, 
um, if I may just compare this, um, French used to be very strong and had a lot strong influence on German um, 200 years ago, and there were a lot of French words in German literature. Nowadays, it's English. Yeah, and this changes, and this is what keeps a language alive, and this is what keeps a language developed, which I find fascinating. Absolutely so, yeah. true. Yeah. Absolutely true. Okay, let's go back. Um, so, so Andy went to the United Kingdom. You had a whole different culture there. You were, you had a different experience. You were a German person. You were suddenly in a new country. Um, did you also teach there? Did I you did. Have okay. I did. I taught German as a foreign language. I went to schools. Um, middle school so I was going up to GCSE I don't know what the equivalent is high school dip no, no it's before high school diploma middle oh, junior school, high school junior high school yeah. American English um, and that was my first year but when I finished my university when I after I had taken my MA I actually moved back I emigrated to the UK <laughs> I wanted to stay there for good um, and believe it or not, I even taught English in England um, to English students, which um, surprised me a little bit. Wow. But I helped English students with their A levels. Oh, and, wow! Um, How was that? <laughs> interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, I felt, yeah, I felt very chuffed to mm -hmm. say it in Lancashire English. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I felt very honoured that they even considered me for teaching. Um, but. Yeah, it was a, more about the grammar and to look at the grammar. And I think if, if you have a non-native speaker who teaches a language, and the same goes, I also teach German as a foreign language, and I find that with colleagues from other countries, they are so much better on teaching the grammar because they had to learn it themselves and knew all the rules, know all the rules and learned all the rules, which we as native speakers, and here I refer to German, you don't because you just pick it up as you go. and. So for me, it's easier to teach English and the rules um, in English. And I prefer that because English grammar is so much better than German grammar. <laughs> um, but, I, but, but do you find it that way? Do you find English grammar, to teach English grammar easier yes, yes, than Yes, because German I had grammar? to learn the rules. And I have to say, I have had a very, very good English teacher at school. And I, I use his examples, actually, most of the time because I don't know, he hammered them into our brains and they are still there. So you could wake me in the middle of the night. Um, I know his examples and I, I can um, tell you the rules, but I have to say I also only learned the grammar for real um, with teaching, Wow. Okay. not with learning. I think it's, it happens if you're out there and you you have to explain to somebody, that's when you really learn. So. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Learning by doing, yeah. Absolutely. Because I personally, I started learning Spanish. To be honest with you, now, German obviously is not my native language, but I found Spanish much harder for me to, to learn as a language than German. I learned German by far easier. Mm -hmm. And and the rule, of course, when you're talking about the articles in this, their D does for me was a catastrophe. But I found Spanish, yeah, it was for me, as far as tenses are concerned, for example. Yeah. That, that was my question. So if you have any, do you think it's easier for a German speaker to learn English than other languages, perhaps? Hmm, good question. I think German students find it very difficult to learn the tenses, okay. mostly because they think they know the tenses and it's exactly the same as in German, the dreaded present perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the English tense system, if we stick with that, is far more precise than the German is. And I think English is far more to the point than German is. Um, so it's easier for somebody who thinks logically, I think, to learn. Um, I don't know whether it's easier to learn English. I think to get the words, and if you're in a Germanic or a language that has a Germanic background, then it is a lot easier to learn English, yes. Very interesting. So, okay, so coming back to your career, technically you started when? As, <laughs> as, as, a, as a language teacher. In 1992. 1992, and yeah. when did you come back to Germany again? Uh, and that was in 1990s. Ooh. 1996. Six. So four years of experience teaching in the UK. Wonderful. You brought that experience here in Germany. 
What did you find different? What did you find interesting when you come when you came back here? First class you're teaching now here in Germany. Did you see a big difference? Did you see, oh my God, these kids learn English in a different way than, than these kids? Well, I have to say it was more in ed I was more in adult education okay. then. Um, I was at universities in, in England, so I had younger students there. And when I came here, I went to language schools and into companies. Mm -hmm. So it was a different, different setup in a way. Um, I think what, yeah, how shall I put this? The, the people I taught here, because they were adults, I mostly got the people who weren't very successful at learning a language when they were younger, yeah. so they didn't really like studying for a language. Correct. And um, my first aim was to sort of feel with them okay. <laughs> and say, it's not so bad and you can actually do that and, and, and meet them where they were and help them to sort of transfer into liking English and then take it from there. I think that's how I first started rather than focusing straight on the on, on expanding the knowledge. Right, right. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because imagine these days, as you know, a lot of people are traveling all around the world. A lot of them, they speak very good English and a lot of them, they have a degree in language teaching. They would like to try their hand teach the language. So my question for you is, I'm a Turkish person coming to Stuttgart. I'm a Ukrainian person coming to Stuttgart. I'm a Japanese person coming to Stuttgart. For you as a professional, do you think it's important for me as a teacher to learn the language of the people I'm teaching English, or is it not important? Do you know what I mean? Is that, does do, that play an important yeah. role? Um, no, I don't think it does not. But, <laughs> but, I think... Here's the, the beautiful German but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it is very important to be open and to hear the people. Um, may I take a different example with a different cultural background? I actually taught Chinese students. Um, both German and English and also Korean. So there the background is completely different. And, nothing to be compared to our European background. Um, for these people, it was a bit of a culture shock coming here, I would say. And I think what is important for a teacher when they teach the language, be it German or English, I taught both languages to these people, um, to some of these people, let's put it this way, um, is to hear them and to hear where they struggle and where they are sort of... Um, confused by what's going on, be it language or also be it culture, and work with that and say, yes, I hear you, I do understand what you mean, um, maybe this will help you. Um, if I may quote a teacher of my, my sons, actually, when they went on their exchange to the US, um, he drilled them before and he said, make sure when you go there to observe but not to judge. And I think this is definitely something we should take on as teachers, to see the students, understand their situation and work with that and take them from that. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do because, I mean, I don't know what they are going through. Um, I try to help them, I try to understand. And I think if you have, and here we are going to building rapport, my, teach, my students will probably just roll their eyes at me because that's one word I always throw at them. Um, but I think with that, that's the, the basis or the main basis to work with. And if you have this rapport, you can, you can work from that and then everything falls into place. And I think a student should feel comfortable, comfortable to say, I don't understand this. Can you explain to this, this to me? Um, I don't like this. We do it differently. And you, you can just tell them, yes, I do see you, but, and maybe it helps you if you do it this way or that way or the other. So. That brings me to another fundamental question. You see, there is a, there's always this debate going on between teachers, uh, professionals, uh, whether a teacher should use students' native language in the class while teaching, let's say in this case, English. Mm -hmm. to, to which group do you, which group do you belong to actually? I try not to use the students' native language and definitely with the Chinese people I surely won't because I don't speak any Mandarin. Um, I think you should do as little as possible. 
Having said this, um, as I've told you before, I also teach German as a foreign language and I just recently had an international group um, at A0 level, level and I did use English, uh, which our, was our common language. Um, people were not all from, um, from an English background, um, rather Spanish or um, Scandinavian background. But we shared English as a common language and I did use English to get into it. So at the beginning, yes, why not? Um, I used to be strictly against it. I learned my lesson, it doesn't okay. always work. Um, what I do though, and even in higher classes, is if we do grammar, if we do focus on grammar, and grammar is not my priority in teaching, but sometimes I think you have to, oh, to like get to some things, <laughs> those things sorted. Um, I do use, the native language, um, so in, in my case this would be German and, and the students are also with, um, of a German background, I do use German to explain that, um, right. just to get the rules and the facts sorted there, ask them questions, let them explain it in German, um, and then for the examples obviously we go back to the target language to English. That is very interesting. We had Rachel Paling with us actually and she also said the same thing, the exact same thing. She said. It's not a problem you, if you can use, use everything you know in order to help you as a teacher oh, yeah, yeah. to, you know, even if, it, if you have to speak the student's native language, that's not a problem. Which goes back to what I said before, this building rapport and make you feel your client or student at ease because I think if you have that background, then the learning is so much easier. Mm -hmm. so. Correct, yeah. Okay, very interesting. So coming back to Stuttgart, you work with different organizations, I, I know from universities to companies to language schools, different age groups, I suppose? Well, yeah, zero okay. to 99, no, not quite that bad, but I would say one, one and a half to mid-70s. Okay, yeah. wow, okay, so how, how do you differentiate between these groups? First of all, do you have a preference? Do you say, okay, I got a, a bunch of 20-year-olds, yes, that's the job is so much more mm -hmm. interesting than or no, you say, listen, each group for me is, is a challenge. I love the challenges. First of all, I love them all. <laughs> but, the German Political but. <laughs> I like to be diplomatic. I definitely prefer working with adults. And I prefer to work with adults who want to learn. So, um, that was your question with the 20 year olds. Sure, um, sure. Some of them are still Mm, haven't quite left their teenage times, let's put it this way. Okay. Um, I find that a bit challenging at times. Um, and I can, I think with growing older myself, I'm running low on patience. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> um, so it's the way they behave in yeah, the class yeah. and not the, the way they learn the language. No, that, that, that is behavior in class. Oh, okay. So what I don't really like to work with and handle with, I think every, every teacher is like that is when you have people and you have to actually tell them how to behave and maybe not play on their phones, um, but listen to me because then they would actually understand what I mean. Um, those are things I don't really, yeah, I, I'm running out of patience with those. Um, working with the language as such, um, yeah, again, I would, I think all groups have their have nice aspects. I mean, go into a little more detail. I used to do play groups okay. and I did play group English for pre kindergarten children. Uh -huh. And a lot of people looked at me and said, Why, why on earth are you doing this? And um, I just thought about bringing up our sons. I wanted to bring them up bilingually, but which unfortunately did not work as we are both German parents. Okay. Um, but what I did with them, and that really paid off looking back, is we had these. Um, children's books okay. and we had some English books with Thomas the Tank Engine and Bob the Builder, those uh -huh. things, I had songs, <laughs> oh, and favorite. we only ever read those in English and I refused to translate these books, I never did, so when we had the book we had Thomas going over the bridge and Bertie going under the bridge or the other way around, I can't recall. <laughs> um, and the kids were fine with that. They, they understood it. They saw it because of the picture. We also did nursery rhymes and songs in English. And I refused to translate those. I also, and when I went to the playgroup, playgroup teaching, I recall one girl who 
loved the songs. We had 10 little monkeys jumping on the bed. Um, you may recall this wow. from older yeah, times. Sure, sure. And it's just play acting. And this is how children learn a language. And especially, I mean, with a, with a kindergarten kid, you can't learn grammar rules. So you do it, you sing it, you have fun. And I think that's a very important aspect also to take into older, cla or older people's classes. Um, which is what I try to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I try, and that's actually something I got from you, Andy. Oh. You told me that. Oh, how is classes. that possible? <laughs> classes should be fun. Students should have fun because then they learn better, and that still rings in my ears. And I think you're absolutely right there. So I'm, I'm glad to I do said that. something yeah. a little bit wise. <laughs> Very interesting, Andy. So um, you, you, you mentioned sometimes the, the participants, the students, whatever you call them, they are not paying enough attention. Do you have any specific methods or do you do anything special to draw the attention? Do you know what I mean? Because we are, we are specifically grown-ups, our patience is not, sometimes we just, we get distracted so easily. Mm -hmm. I can speak about myself. Mm -hmm. You, you, you're thinking about too many things. And you're mm -hmm. sitting in a classroom. You don't want to be disrespectful to the teacher, mm -hmm. but you just your mind just drifts away. Yeah. Do you have anything that you can recommend to our audience? Um, I am, again, I have to quote my English teacher okay. from older times. He used to just stare people out. Okay. Um, that doesn't always work um, because sometimes students don't bother. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, but what I try to do is keep them active, keep them going. Um, this is something I do in language classes, um, that everybody has to be active all the time. Um, this can be a bit stressful. I just did this um, English language class um, last week, which was an intensive class, which we had all day, every day for a whole week. And my students, I think, were dead in the evening. Um, but, um, yeah, I think if you, if you keep them active, if you give them a task that they have to work on everybody and they don't sort of can sit back and lean back and dream of the next holiday, but have to be there and then connect these activities again so that, for example, if you set one task, there's a follow on task and so on. Um, keep them going, basically, and let them do it and not just stand there and lecture. I try not to do that. Um, that's something I learned from and that a colleague. That is a big problem. I, I can tell you, um, every time uh, a teacher, I always differentiate between teaching and lecturing, mm. to be honest. And when, when that happens, just the whole atmosphere goes a little bit into Absolutely. boredom. And the students enjoy it more if they can do it. I mean, in, in German, when we do the grammar, for example, I even let the students put together their own grammar tasks, wow. like with gap texts. I haven't done this so much in English yet, but I want to, because they are enjoying that. Um, it makes them think, it makes them go through what you actually do if, if you teach grammar. But I think you can also do that with other things, lexical tasks or, or pronunciation tasks. I mean, anything is possible, I would say. Andy, what's your take on audiovisual um, materials to, uh, while teaching for a teacher? What, are you a person who, who, is a, who is a stark believer in those aids? Do you use them actively in your classes or what's, what's your take on them? Um, I do use them. I think videos or especially TED Talks, I'm not sure I'm allowed to mention them here. <laughs> um, I think that's a great set. I think that really helps with teaching, really um, supports the teaching. Um, it shouldn't be too long. I'm not very good at, I know that some teachers like to show films and just show snippets of films and then talk through them. I'm not a great person for doing that. I'd rather use that as a basis to carry on with uh -huh. like the tasks we set up or, or we have to, the goals we have to achieve in the course. I think it's great. It's a great support. I definitely believe, and I learned that from my sons, okay. um, that watching YouTube videos um, is a great chance to to enhance your language learning. And this is what I tell weaker students to watch something they are interested in, in the 
in English without subtitles because right. I believe that they can actually listen and understand and train that listening skill. So um, teaching all these adults in different classes, um, does it ever happen to you that you say, you know what, it's time, I've done, it's only 30 minutes in the into the class and you think the class is not ready for the material. The class is just not in the mood. Do you know what I mean? What, what's your decision at that point in time? Or 45 minutes in your class, you have another 45 minutes to run the show. It doesn't happen very often because, again, that's something I think we talked about before with the listening. Um, and I think I'm a fairly sensitive person, actually. So I pick up vibes very easily. Sometimes this can be a bit of a hindrance because um, I'm too sensitive to these things. Okay. Um, but I think it is important to do that. And mostly I go sort of with the flow without wanting to praise myself too much here. But I think I'm fairly good at that. So I see and feel how people or the atmosphere in the, in the class is developing and I take it from there. So I would say I'm fairly flexible. Um, of course, if you have to reach a goal like exams at the end and you have to go through through something, through certain material, there is not much of not much leeway, so you can't play around too much. Um, but if I feel, as you said, something is not working at all, I definitely change the thing around. Um, that's the good thing about having taught so for so, such a long time sure. um, that I have done so many things, and I've got quite a bit of experience now to remember classes, um, remember situations, and I always have something which I can think of. Um, we did uh, for Altas a course, Oh No, What a Personal Disaster yes, to yes, 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 Success, which actually dealt um, with exactly that situation. Um, so imagine you are in a situation, you have no material, technology doesn't work. That happened to me quite a bit actually, that video recorders or televisions at that time did not work. And I was there, I had a film prepared as a last thing, last minute resort, and I couldn't, I couldn't because the technology wasn't either available or didn't work. Um, and I had 90 minutes to cover, which when I was a young teacher, threw me, definitely, <laughs> and I panicked. Um, no, being an old teacher, I feel much better about yeah, it because <laughs> an experienced experience teacher. teacher. Yeah, um, I'd say that. Um, okay. Yeah, so you can always fall back on something. I did many teacher training classes, which I found very interesting, where you actually work with nothing right. and let the students develop a task. Right. And again, you, you meet them and, and meet them there and take it Absolutely. from there. So, and that's something where I think you have to trust your own gut that Absolutely. it works. And if you do that, it does. So. True. Andy, we're living at the age of technology, obviously. Companies, if you're working with companies and corporations, they're cutting costs dramatically. Obviously, training, as you know, is normally the first target of many corporations. And with the rise of many, many platforms that actually use softwares, let's say, to teach uh, participants or students languages, I'm, I'm talking about softwares like Rosetta Stone and, and all these kind of programs. What's your take on, on that? Do you think softwares could actually replace an actual teacher? Do you believe in that? Um, yes. Um, no. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> Software can never, ever um, replace a teacher. I don't believe in that at all. It's definitely... I think it would be okay to use the software to sort of get a grip on the language, to use it in, let's say, a first, um, first step to learn to get an idea of the language. So if you travel abroad, let's say I wanted to go to Shanghai, so I'm pretending to be a linguistic genius now, I learn a few words from that um, to get around to by myself a cup of coffee or, or get some food, yes, for that, yes. But not to learn a language in the sense of language teaching. I think there is much more behind it. Um, we talked about culture before. Um, that is definitely a part of language learning. Um, 
also we talked about building rapport that is a part of language learning and I don't think any software can deliver that there may be the ther theoretical background yes for sure um, but theoretical does never um, um, replace. replace thank you <laughs> does <laughs> never replace um, the practical yeah sure I okay I agree um, okay good now question for you is Let's come down to Altus. Um, how did you find the organization? How did you uh, get in? You, you were the Altus ex-chair. You did a lot for the organization. I, I talked to a lot of people. Everybody only agrees with that. And of course, we as a community, we are always thankful for the people who work for our community. My question to you is, so tell us, walk me through your Altus story. And, and also, um, I want to ask you um, whether you recommend organizations such as Altus to young, new teachers. For sure, for sure. Um, yes, Altus and all our co-organizations all over Germany and in England worldwide. That is such, a, such an important group, organization for teachers to group up with. For sure, and I'm so glad that I found Altus because so I start from the back actually, okay. um, because that actually helped me for the first time in all my teaching experience to connect and exchange thoughts and ideas with teacher. Because so far I always was on my own teaching as a freelance teacher. You're not really like in a school where you're part of a whole system of a whole network. I mean, of course, I knew fellow teachers, I knew colleagues, yeah, but they would be French colleagues. They would teach French, for example, and not English, which, yeah, to a certain ex extent, you can exchange your thoughts, but French is different to English. Sure. I don't speak any French or hardly any French, so it was different. I needed somebody to say, yes, this task does work, this one doesn't. Um, so, yeah, for sure, and it has changed my life, for sure. Um, you asked me how I came to Altus? Yes, how did you, how did you know about Altus yeah. and, and what's your experience? I came, I first came across Altus when I went to a workshop which was, I think it was with Michael Swan and okay. Catherine Walters. And what year was that? That must have been 2014, oh, okay. summer of 2014. It was either that or with David Crystal. Okay. And these are people I knew from when I was a student. Michael Swan being the great grammarian who comes into his workshops and introduces himself as, hi, I'm Mike, I like grammar, which is a shock to everybody, but sure. I think sure. <laughs> really sure. good, so that's funny. David Crystal, everybody knows, of course. He was my linguistic, one of my linguistic gods when I was okay. a student. Okay. Um, and I was just interested in seeing these people. And Altus actually cooperated with a publisher at the time and I came to see these people and then there was one of our great predecessors which was um, Christina Key oh, and yes. she was there um, and her together with the then event manager Marlene Lawrence, um, these two jumped at me and made me there and then at the very first um, workshop I did, I participated in sign my name up for Altus. Wow, the and yeah, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> they I, 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 I prefer to say they lured me into okay. this group. Uh -huh. um, and um, yeah, I wanted to think about it, but they didn't really give me time to think about it. And as soon as I signed up, it was like, you know, you can also play, play an active part. And they really worked on me. And I am so grateful that they did. And I'm so grateful that I actually decided to Right. do take an active but how did Altus develop you how, how did like I'm, I'm a person out there I'm a teacher I have no connection to any community of let's say language teachers I want to know firsthand from you what did Altus do for you that you would say listen guys if you're out there teaching English you gotta come join this community mm -hmm. well first of all of course it was the very interesting workshops Altus always has on offer um, they, through, through the social network, which is what makes Altas, um, they know people worldwide. worldwide. They, 
working closely with publishers, um, other language associations, we do get very interesting speakers in. Um, there's always a variety. Um, we ask members what they are interested in, take it from there, try to get workshops built on their opinion. So this is why the feedback forms are so very important and of why course. we need them. <laughs> um, and I think that aspect is the one that has had the great imp the greatest impact on me because it was not only the workshop I learned from which was interesting, but also to then have the exchange with colleagues, with colleagues who work in different language schools at different places, in different towns, cities even, and everybody has a different perspective. We may have, we may share a common background and the interest in language teaching or our profession of teaching languages, but we all have a different outlook on things. And I think that is, that is something that thrills me that I like to see how other people go about it. Or if something, as you asked me before, what do you do if something does not work? Um, it just helps to, to talk about it, to exchange ideas. I once had a Japanese student where we had a, that again was for a German class though, um, and we had a real culture shock because this woman, this lady was really, she was great on doing all the tasks, but as soon as I started to get her away from the book and talk to me and have a conversation, um, her very good German with the tasks was gone. And it took me forever to find out that she actually did not want to tell me any personal details and that that was the problem and that was a cultural difference. Um, and that is something I got to learn from other colleagues, from people who taught in Japan and knew a bit about the culture, so I learned from them. Very interesting, very interesting. Okay, um, from being a member of Altus to the top of Altus, how was the experience? You did a lot of things. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about your achievements, um, your experience. What, what did you like about it, uh, serving the community? Um, first of all, I just loved being with the colleagues. I got so much support from everybody with my own teaching, with my own ideas. And it was just great because I had the support. I wanted to give something back. Um, I started off as secretary for Altus. Um, so I did the paperwork. Um, I think most of us started like that. And then um, the position for event manager was free. And um, I just thought that would be a really, really interesting thing to do because you can actually reach out to people, get to know the interesting people, the speakers, and talk to them personally, um, connect, um, which is what I absolutely loved and enjoyed about doing the job. And then. Um, yeah, I moved on from there, I did that for a while, I moved on from there um, to the um, deputy and then chair position and I think it's, I just love Altus because... <laughs> <laughs> I see it when so you much. talk about Altus, I see it in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I just love them, I think it's a great community and I think yeah. we all do so much for the, each other and support each other so much and we all thrive from what we give out, um, we take, and yeah, it's give and take basically. And um, I love giving and I love taking as well. <laughs> um, and yeah, I can't really say much more about that. Um, the events, of course, are the, the biggest thing. This is what the Altus lives off, and that's the main thing what, what makes Altus. Um, Great. And yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Very nice point. Andy, I also want to talk to you about the, the financial aspect of language teaching, uh, because that's something I think perhaps we don't talk a lot about. You know, for, for, for language teachers, most of us are freelancers, and um, we either work for companies, for language schools, or directly with companies. Do you have, you have, you've had years of experience working all over the place. What's your, again, I'm a person watching this video, I just got in from the United States, I just got in from the UK, different countries, what's your suggestion, what's your experience, what is something you would like to share with us so that you the help financial. us financially? Mm, this is difficult, I don't, 
don't often talk about it. Um, I think we are mostly underpaid, okay. um, I, especially if you work for a language school. I do see why they can't pay as much as if you are um, just offering the classes. Mm. Of course, you can, um, can ask for more. Mm. It's a difficult question, actually. Um, I think it always depends on what situation you are in personally, but I think we are not the value to the extent, extent a business person, for example, is valued, a coach, if we talk about coaching in, in, in a business situation. Um, I think that's tricky, and I think language t teachers, language coaches, deserve so much more respect because we're not only teaching the language, if we're thinking about the business, um, business level now, um, but we also teach confidence, which is a big part, I think. Standing up, going out there, presenting, we are helping and supporting people with their own work. Definitely. And I think that that doesn't get seen enough. Very interesting. Andy, is there anything in your career that you're proud of? If you want to name one, that when you look back, you say, you know what, I did this, I'm super happy about it. Difficult, difficult question. I know. I have to That's think my job. A bit. <laughs> Take your time. I'm proud that all my students survived. <laughs> Let's put it this way. I did not give up. Okay. Uh, most, I hardly had anybody give up in the classes. So that is something I'm proud of. Okay. And maybe that those people who hated being a language student uh -huh. for, with memories from school come out and see that they use the language they learn as a tool and not as a student of English or a student of German where they have to go into literature, which I of course love, but they don't. Um, but that, that is, for them is just a tool to do what they want to do. Maybe that, so that I, I can get that into their heads and take away the inhibitions, the obstacles of daring to use the language. Absolutely. I hope. I think. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Any regrets when you look back at your career? Anything, if you went back, you would like to change or you would have done it differently? Actually, no. I, if I may, may add on to that, I was, when I finished university, I actually wanted to go into research uh -huh. because I'm a psycholinguist by wow. background. Um, and I worked, the, this is why I was in the Netherlands at the Max Planck Institute mm -hmm. for psycholinguistics for six months as a, I did like an internship mm -hmm. there. And that was my idea, that's yeah. what I wanted to do. Um, unfortunately, this didn't work out and for a long time, for years and years, I was very sad that this did not work out. Now you asked me whether I regretted anything. Looking back, I am so glad I did not, <laughs> it did not work out. Um, because I think I prefer and enjoy the teaching and leading other people, my students, participants to success a lot more than actually just sitting at my desk and doing, I call it dry research, though I'm still very much interested in the topic. So, um, no, I'm actually happy it worked out the way it did. Mm -hmm. You're more in the field kind of person. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Andy, it was really a pleasure. If there is anything you would like to add or if there is any topic you would like to talk about, you got I the mic, you got the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> I can only tell people, do join Altus and um, yeah, see what we have on offer, any language association because there's so much to take away from it. And I hope that came across a little bit. And Definitely. I'm just so happy I can still be with you lot. So. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Guys, that's, that wraps up another episode of uh, Altus Head to Head. We had a great conversation with Andy Vaknas, our, uh, our ex-Altus chair, and a fantastic teacher today. Um, hope you guys liked it. If you did like it, please make sure you subscribe, you hit the like but button, and share the video to their fellow teachers so they also can um, take advantage of Andy's experiences. Thank you so much. See you next time. Thank you.